This is the nicest library I've ever seen. <laughs> you guys are so lucky. <laughs> Uh, if you haven't guessed, I'm Naima. So. <laughs> I, I know you were wondering. I just wanted to clear it up. So. <laughs> okay. Do you do you want to start with the introductions then, or do you want me oh, to start? Well, yeah. you just started. I've already started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Naima Simone, and I'm a USA Today best-selling author. I write contemporary romance, um, romance suspense. I write uh, erotic romance, and I'm published with Harlequin and Entangled Publishing. Hey. I'm Sarah McLean, and I write historical romances uh, for HarperCollins. I also write a column for the Washington Post about romance and gender um, in the world. And what else? Oh, and I host a podcast called Fate of Mates, which is weekly hey. and talks about deep dive romance novel tropes and themes and why romance is important in the world. And it's awesome. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Sally Kilpatrick. I write um, small town, um, well, small town kind of romance, but I have quirky characters, so I fall into the category of mainstream with romantic elements, or let's just all agree that we all need a happily ever after. That's, <laughs> um, there are going to be cows and llamas and um, farmers <laughs> and funeral directors, and that's kind of my wheelhouse. <laughs> llamas and funeral directors. Yes. We really have something for everyone in romance. Yeah, exactly. But not a funeral director for llamas. That's different. It's not the same thing. <laughs> Okay, so um, that gives you a good cross-section of the different types of romance. We haven't even covered them all. We no. haven't got paranormal. I mean, there really is something for everyone. Um, and, oh, and Sarah had the great idea that we will try to take some questions as we go along also. But it's very it's dark It's very out there. hard to see, but we will overcome. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about... The history of romance? Yeah, I think it would be useful. Oh, look, they're making it less dark. Thank oh, you. Hi. <laughs> I love that. Can you bring me a sandwich? <laughs> uh, yeah, it would be helpful. Um, so I think that when we talk about romance, often when I talk about romance, and I do it a lot to a lot of people who don't really know very much about romance, except for Fabio. Um, and... And so I think it's all often very useful to kind of paint a picture, and it's a little bit Romance 101, with apologies to those of you who have been reading the genre for a long time, but I'm guessing that there are people in the room who've never touched a romance novel. And so um, it's useful to have a conversation about where romance came from and what romance means and what it is in the world. Romance, as we write it, as we talk about it, as you think about it, Fabio, um, is no, really the construction, it's a, it's a fairly modern construction. It's uh, the youngest of the genres of literature. It's one of the few genres that you can actually touch the beginnings of. The first romance novel, modern romance novel, was a book called The Flame and the Flower, which was published mm -hmm. in 1972. Um, which was best read in 1972. <laughs> um, <laughs> says the woman who read it four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> But that's neither here nor there. My apologies for interrupting. <laughs> right? True. Totally True. Different time. But um, well, so um, it was it was written by a woman named Kathleen Woodowis, who is a Midwestern housewife, who described herself as a Midwestern housewife, whose husband read a lot of adventure novels, and who decided that it was time to put a woman at the center of an adventure novel. Um, she wrote what was a 500-page epic. Mm tour across, um, um, about, across England and then over an ocean and then into uh, the American South. And um, it included, it was the first book that was published that had sex on the page, actual sex on the page, mm -hmm. um, and a heroine who had sex out of wedlock and survived. <laughs> and, well, I mean, and, and that's important because these days, I mean, I joked, but these days, um, a lot of times people will talk about those, those romance novels of the 70s and the 80s and call them rapey, but you have to realize that that was almost like a, a means of permission to discuss these things on the page and to put women at the center of the experience. Right. So romance became a genre that 
as a matter of course, centers women, centers women in happiness, in love, in p pleasure, in parity, power. in power, mm -hmm. um, and in triumph, which had literally never been done before. Um, and the manuscript was sent to Avon Books, uh, which at the time was only doing pulp fiction and classic reprints. And the, the editor pulled it off a pile, read it, and said, well, let's try this. And it sold two million copies in one year. Goodness. Which is and all of publishing said, wait, women spend money on books. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? And, and now women keep publishing afloat. Yeah. <laughs> so that's true. Romance is 65% of the paperback fiction market today. Um, it is a massive juggernaut of a genre, mm -hmm. and it is deeply misunderstood. Yes. Um, but what's important is in 1972, when we were writing books that were a little rapey, um, or that did have these kind of what we think of as, you know, a woman being forced into um, an experience by a man, or there are a lot of... Um, there are a lot of real problematic elements that we think of about those early books. We have to remember what was happening alongside romance in 1972. Which is at, the women's movement. Yes. So at the same time, um, Gloria Steinem was standing up at the DNC and saying, if the Democratic Party doesn't pay attention to women, they're going to lose women, the women's vote forever. Um, Ms. Magazine was launched. Across the board, the women's movement was happening. Women were coming into the workforce. Um, in 1972, it was illegal for a husband to rape a wife, and so it was happening on the page of romance novels. We were having that conversation about consent on, mm -hmm. on the page. In 1972, a married woman couldn't hold a credit card, couldn't open her own bank account. These things, but romance was centering, uh, was centering women in power, and they were, it, was, it ended up being a real conversation about patriarchy, and that's really where I come That's to, when I come to the romance genre, um, is this idea that it's con in constant reflection with uh, the way the world is treating women and marginalized people. Um, after, into the, the 80s, we saw the rise of the working girl romance as we saw the rise of women in the workplace. Um, in the 90s, we saw the rise of the beta hero um, as we saw an economy that was really centering women as breadwinners, as par equal partners in the home. And then in 2001, after 9-11, we saw the rise of paranormal romance, where um, what romance was actually doing in, the, in that time was having a conversation about women's worries. Um, we were all terrified. The big bad that had attacked, um, and this obviously is a very American genre. There's a whole different history for romance beyond America. Um, but after, we, we couldn't identify an enemy. Our enemies so we, suddenly became very like difficult to see. And, um, and romance created heroes and heroines who were literally larger than life and could mm -hmm. save the world and also fall in love. Mm -hmm. And then, and one more thing, and then I will stop talking. You don't have to. <laughs> hey. But then um, in 2010, we had a massive recession. In 2008, 9, and 10 in America. And we called it the he session. The media started calling it a he session because men were losing their jobs at a higher rate than women were. And a lot of women were becoming primary breadwinners at home. And those women in the audience will understand that, and some men, um, We'll understand that women do a lot of emotional work in the house, right? We make sure that our kids are clean and fed and that uh, dinner is on the table and homework is done and laundry. doctor's appointments are made and laundry is done. Um, and at the same time, women across America were having to do all that emotional work and retain emotional relationships with family and friends and also go to work, work. and get a paycheck and come home and pay the bills. And that immense worry was deeply reflected in a very undersung romance novel called Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes. <laughs> in which, which probably most of you have never heard of. Yeah. Um, in which a very, 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 very wealthy man takes care of things like computers and cars and, yeah, that's and, not and other things that. Of, yeah, <laughs> and other things. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because the truth is that if you can't see the, and a lot of people, I mean, everywhere I go, every time I have one of these talks, someone raises their hand, so I'm heading it off at the pass, but we yes. can talk about it if you have questions. Everybody, somebody says, can you explain Fifty Shades of Grey? And 
you know, if I really could, I wouldn't be here. I'd be living on an island, yes. <laughs> swimming in a pool of money. Um, <laughs> but what I will say is that if it is a challenge for you to understand why women would have been drawn to the idea of a man who like made sure there was food in the fridge and that your apartment was standing and that your car would run and that there was $25,000 in your checking account and literally bought the business you work for to make sure you had great homework mm -hmm. balance and then also figure out a way to make sure you had pleasure on the regular. Yeah. You're not working that hard to think about like <laughs> what that would mean to most women. So yeah. um, it's like my father said, um, I, I write a lot of billionaire romance. And when I was trying to explain to him, like he was like, well, what are you writing about today? And I'm like, well, you know, he's a billionaire. And, what, and I, well, he's like, do you write any blue collar people? I was like, well, <laughs> I was like, Daddy, well, I know Naima because I want to see you write about a poor man. I was like, well, that's not really romantic, you know? Like, <laughs> he needs to have, like, a really good job. That's romantic. He doesn't have to be a billionaire. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have to be a billionaire, but he needs a job, like, you know? Yes. So. <laughs> Well, money is worry, right? I mean, everyone in this room has, exactly. at one point or another has probably worried about money. Yeah. And um, romance's work is to show women triumphing, women and other people triumphing, and worry is a block to that. Um, and so we talk a lot about happily ever after because exactly. it's, a, it's, it's a dream. The, it's the goal. <laughs> yeah, we're living the dream, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Um, well, and it's kind of interesting um, because, of course, me being me and never doing anything the easy way, um, it, at this time of history where everybody else is, tends to write billionaires, then my heroes tend to be the folks that maybe don't get a happily ever after. Um, so I've got a farmer and a minister and a funeral director. This sounds like a bad joke. <laughs> the beginning of yeah, one. What? I mean, so like seriously, the these are, for, for me, what I wanted to show, um, and probably from having read so many romances from the, the 70s and the 80s, and sometimes it was even worse. Like, I remember one particular Harlequin I picked up. It's only from her point of view. So you don't understand why this, this male character is acting so... You don't understand why he's acting the way he acts because you never go into his head. Mm -hmm. Right. So my whole thing was I wanted to show... Um, here's, you can be treated, you can be treated well. You don't have to have somebody boss you around. You don't have to have, you, you can have somebody who's emotionally available to you. And I mean, I think we all do that, but I just took it to the extreme, um, with, with characters you wouldn't normally associate with romance. I don't have any cowboys or billionaires or members of the pier or anything like that. Well, because... Love is ubiquitous, right? Exactly. Like, which I think is, it runs counter, it, it's part of why romance is so disdained by much of literary, of, of sort of the literary world, because we use, we see love all the time, right? Like love sells chewing gum and car insurance and like clothing and Clone. like we use it all the time. Right. We see it everywhere and everybody seems to have a story about their love or somebody they know is love. And so it feels pedestrian in some way when um, in actual fact, it's, one it's, of the most like unique personal things that any of us can experience, and it's really universal. From the specific to the universal. Yeah, last night. I remember when, um, well, I've, I've always read romance. Like I used to, my, my mother worked um, the third shift, so whenever she left for work at like eight o'clock, you know, my sister and I would sneak in her room and go read her romances and make sure before she came back that we replaced them just the way she left them like, <laughs> out. So I grew up like reading Joanna Lindsay and Julie Garwood and Virginia Henley. And when I, I kept it a secret that I wanted to, that my dream was to be an author. And so my father, my father's a reverend, you know, he's a minister and he's, I didn't tell him for the longest time, even though he knew I, I, I read it, I didn't, when I told him I wanted to write, I didn't tell him what I wanted to write. I don't know if he thought I was gonna write Chicken Soup for the Soul. Or, <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. That also but, would've been good for swimming pool that's, money. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> so when I got, when I sold my first contract and I called him and I said, Daddy, I sold a book, they bought my book. That's wonderful. Now what is it you write again? I was like, oh yeah, I didn't, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> but he got such a kick out of it because he understands as a, as a pastor 
that one of the greatest power in this world, and I don't even, I don't really care what religion you are, you know, who you, who you worship, one of the greatest powers in this world is love because it heals, it brings redemption, um, it causes sacrifice, it brings understanding, it brings a joy that's beyond our understanding. And so he loved the idea that his daughter was writing love. He preached it, and I wrote it in a different way, but... <laughs> <laughs> And never the twain shall meet, you know? So, but that's another reason, like, I, when people ask me or, you know, because I often get the question, why do you write romance? Like, you know, and it's, it is that disdain, you know? But then mm -hmm. I, you, everybody wants love. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants to feel as if they belong. Imperfect as we are, we want someone to love and accept us as imperfect as we are. And we all want that happily ever after. Our happily ever afters don't all look the same. But it is one of the greatest powers that we all believe in, like universally and collectively. And so that's why we write it. That's why it's 65% of, you know, publishing. Mm -hmm. Because people are hungry for it. You well, know, especially in the climate that we're in and things that are going on. It's a place where you know good will always triumph over evil. Love will always, uh, I'm about to quote my father here. Well, actually quote God, I guess, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it covers a multitude of sins, you know, yes. and so it, it brings us together. And so that, and that's what people want. And, and so I believe that's why it's one of the greatest genres and I wouldn't want to write anything else. Well, and I think that one of the important messages is that each and every one of us deserves Absolutely. love, and each and every one of us deserves to find someone who loves us in that way. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think, you know, it's interesting, as you were talking, I was thinking, well, wait, why do I write romance novels? And part of it is that in my own library, when I was growing up, when I was 10 or 11, I found the... Uh, the three rows of shelves that had the lights turned off. Um. And I was like, what did they keep in here? <laughs> it must what be good did stuff. They, keep in they kept there. Fabio in there. Oh. Um, Could you he believe like, it was like butter? <laughs> um, but so there's that, right? There's sort of the initial like salaciousness of the, like the, of course that's part of it for me um, coming at it from a, you know, 11 year old. But now I think part of why I love writing romance so much is because it's so fast. Because it is such a, we write romance, I mean, I'm very slow. I write a book a year, but you write About a thousand books yeah. a year. Um, <laughs> yes, that's what I write, yes. <laughs> um, but romance writes incredibly fast. Romance readers are incredibly voracious. Yes. Uh, the average romance reader reads between 10 and 12 books a month. Um, mm -hmm. Some, yeah. some that yeah. many a week. Um, I keep a log and I'm on number eight for this month. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I think there is this real sense that um, romance has to continually, this is, this is a voracious block of readers who need to be fed. Um, and for me, what that means is that there is a constant dialogue with the world and what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. So we see, um, in me, we see changes politically, socially, um, media, we, we see changes in the media, we see things rise in the media, right? We see uh, Game of Thrones rise and like people start writing fantasy romances and you know, we start, we really are in a constant dialogue with readers and what I love about that, and this is, you know, me, Smith College graduate who like just loves groups of women hanging out together and talking, is the dialogue that we're having with other women yes. constantly and saying like, this is a worry for you, money is a worry for you, you're married to a yes. farmer and you don't know like where the next check is coming from, here's how you can see yourself in triumph. Well, and I think that what we're seeing, we were, we were talking about how we wanted to talk about like trends and where romance is going. And right now, one of the things that I see that's so heartening um, I keep thinking of Alyssa Cole's Duke by Default, where the heroine has ADHD, 
um, we've come a long way from the blonde, blue-eyed nurse who falls for the doctor. You can find yourself somewhere in a Absolutely. romance novel. And, and you think this is just, you know, this is entertainment, but actually that book really spoke to me. I'm like, I really see what you're saying, Portia. I really understand where you're coming from, your struggles, um, the places where you forget things. Um, and she gets a happily ever after. And we're seeing that more with, I mean, all the different... I think my, my daughter, she's starting to read romance, thank goodness, because <laughs> she's 14, and I was like, what are we going to talk about? Because, you know, she's <laughs> And so, but she's really, the last year, she's really gotten into romance, and um, the, one of her favorite books, one of my worries was, because we also watch, her and I, we bond over Hallmark Christmas movies, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> yeah, I do. And so we didn't see, I love Hallmark, you know, I love Hallmark, but we didn't see a lot of diversity in it. And Hallmark start last year out of, I think, 28 movies, 12 of them had diverse characters. And I got so excited because while she's watching these movies, we both enjoy them and we enjoy them for the story, we enjoy them for the message and the happily ever after. She didn't get to see herself getting a happily ever after. And one thing that when she started picking up romance to read, she, her favorite book is Everything, Everything. And one of the things, she, she loved the story, of course, because my daughter likes any story where somebody dies or is sick in it or something. I don't oh, know why yeah. that makes it romantic. But the, the main character, the heroine, she was, she was black. And she felt so connected and so excited. And she came in and she was like, oh my God, mommy, she's me, she's black, she's so pretty. And, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I, almost, I almost teared up because she gets to see that she earned, she, she deserves her own happily ever after. Women that look like her, girls that look like her mm -hmm. are so worthy of a happily ever after. And so when Hallmark started making, like, bringing more diverse, you know, movies, we, would, we just loved it because, and I loved it, because it's a reflection to her that you can be powerful, you can be successful, you can be educated, you can make your own choices, you can um, own your own business, and you can still have love. And that is all your choice. And for her, for her to see that, because when I was younger, I didn't see that. I remember I got excited when I saw my first black character in Sandra Brown's French Silk, and she was this <laughs> model. And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna be a model, I'm gonna be a mom. <laughs> and, <laughs> old girl died. I was like, okay, baby, I'm not gonna be her. <laughs> she <died. laughs> but she doesn't have to seek out that much. You know, we still have a long way to go in this industry as far as diversity, and not just, not just women of color, but women of different cultures, different religions, different, um, you know, sexualities. You know, we still have a way to go, but we've made so many strides. And I think of any genre, romance is leading the way in I think, diversity. I and think that, that that's so important. Does. Because we have, we, we're showing that um, your main characters are reflecting the world around us. And I'm, I'm proud of our genre for that. Like I said, we do have a way to go, but we are leading the way in that to show that everyone deserves the, the happily ever after. Everyone, does, everyone is capable of earning a degree. Everyone is smart. Everyone, no matter where you are, who, where you come from, your background, your economical background, cultural background, religious background, you are so worthy of everything that you reach for and you can reach for it and you can be successful at it. That is it, exactly. <laughs> Did we want to take questions? Yeah, are there yeah. questions? I have a question. Oh, yes. yes. Oh. Well, I'm oh. thrilled. You always remember your first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> we can't even, don't worry, we can't see you blush either. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I have two siblings, so my mother knew what was going on, <laughs> I think. Um, 
I actually, I, I don't have a story, but my mother is a Hemingway scholar. She has a PhD in literature and her research is in uh, nihilism and Hemingway. <laughs> oh, what? So we don't talk a whole lot about my books, um, but I do. <laughs> She's the opposite of me. Um, but I do have a funny story about my father, and it's not about my books, but as I said, I was very young, and I found romances um, in the way that I think all of us did, where my sister was a romance reader, and she was 10 years older than me, and I started reading her books, but she hid them from um, my parents because she was probably smarter than me. Or, um, I did not. And uh, I left, I don't know how many romance readers there are in here, but I left Joanna Lindsay's Gentle Rogue in the oh, bathroom one that day. Um, With the pirate on the cover. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> James Mallory. Um, awesome. And I left it in the bathroom one day, and my dad, um, who routinely like read exclusively in bathrooms, like he was ah. like a <laughs> Nelson, there was gotcha. always a Nelson DeMille book in the bathroom growing up. Um, I think he must have finished. Uh, one of his books, and he it was like the middle of the night. Um, no, it was the middle of the day, or you know, 10 a.m. You know, whenever it was, and it was, but it was daytime. And he must have picked up Gentle Rogue, and he opened it to one of those scenes. Of course, um, he did. And took it to my mother, who was ironing in the kitchen, and like brandished it above his head, and said, "Do you know what she is reading?" And my mother, without hesitation, said, "Well, would you rather she wasn't reading?" <laughs> So. I mean, <laughs> I, I really think that I owe my high SAT scores to all the vocabulary I learned in historical Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure there was some literature. See, also English history, like for me, historicals, right? I right? knew all Absolutely. the kings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what about your parents? Your my mom's parents, here. My mom's here. Have, let's have her. And, and everybody's <laughs> like, what does your mom think about your book? I don't, I don't have that many sex scenes. But I'm like, well, she read it before I sent it to the publisher. So I guess I'm OK. <laughs> <laughs> it's really handy having an English major for a mom. Um, yeah, I may or may not have borrowed some of her books at times. Sorry, mom. <laughs> She started me on Barbara Cartland, but then I found the Harlequins, and then I found a Regency romance that I adore so much that the cover has come off of it, and I can never remember if it's the Duchess and the Devil or the Devil and the Duchess, but there was a devil, and there was, <laughs> was a, a Duchess, duchess. <laughs> and there were things and deals and a sword and a sheath. It was very enlightening. <laughs> um, <laughs> But really, I think of um, one of my critique partners, her uh, daughter wanted to read G Game of Thrones, and then she also wanted to read a romance novel, and they let her read Game of Thrones because they were figuring, well, she'll read about 100 pages and get tired of this. Oh, God. And, um, but then, and which is what happened. I mean, it was one of those calculated parenting moves where I really don't necessarily want you to read this right this minute, but I'm just going to let you start it. Sure. And then she wanted to read Cressley Cole, and she was like, I don't think you're ready for Cressley Cole. And the daughter came back with, okay, so let me get this straight. You're okay with letting me read Game of Thrones and all of that violence, <laughs> but you're not okay with me reading Cressley Cole and like true love and happily ever after. And my friend's like, you have a very good point. Here is my Cressley Cole collection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, can I be mad about Game of Thrones for a second? Can you, are you, can, go I'm going to be mad about Game of Thrones for you a second. Be, I'm so <laughs> mad. I, yeah. We'll be so mad together. Here's my thing about Game of Thrones. I don't know how many Game of Thrones watchers there are, but it's not just about Game of Thrones. But so Game of Thrones was on for however many seasons and we saw so much sex on that yeah. show. And it was always sex between, that we were supposed to feel bad about. It was always It was a always power sex play. that ended with like, shameful. it was either it was taboo always... or incest or at the end of, of, of that, somebody died. <laughs> and the reality is, is that when the, when the producers of that show finally gave us a romance that like we could really get behind, that could end in Happily Ever After, they took it away from us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel like there is the conversation about sex on the page and sex in media often is so stripped away from the conversation about partnership and love and happiness. Oh, and and, like, and, and romance is one of the only places I've ever seen it done where it is about 
happiness and joy and pleasure and partnership. And intimacy and, and communication. And I really and resent yeah. the producers of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm not bitter at all. I She's will not. sign your petition. <laughs> to redo that whole Jamie and Brienne whole we arc. We need to, well, there are several but, arcs. Uh, but we spend so um, much time like giving well, our money and, and time. And my and other and thing is that so often as a society, we let so much violence out there on TV and movies and in books to some extent. Books don't bother me as much because I think kids kind of take what they can handle from a book much more so than movies or TV where it's the visual is right there. Right. And honestly, I would rather my kids see a sex scene between two people who are in a committed relationship and have come together as equals and are treating each other you know, out of, out of love than all of the violence. Why, why are we so more accepting of violence than, than love? That's my question to all of you. I'm <laughs> um, happy to take responses. Um, like, I'm, an old, the door. I'm an old high school teacher. It's gonna have to be 500 words. <laughs> uh, double space, please. Make sure your hand raises. Okay, no. All right. <laughs> Are there well, other questions? Oh, sorry. You, oh, go, you go. My, my story is a lot different from theirs. Because like I mentioned before, my father, is a, he's a pastor. He was the first person I called. I don't think I meant to. I think he was like the first person that answered when I called and, and told. And his immediate, he actually surprised me. When I told, he, he loves it. He loves the fact that I'm a romance writer. Um, matter of fact, he, caught, he would tell his um, congregation members, my daughter's a romance. My, no, he would just say, my daughter's a writer. And they were like, really, is she published? Yes, go check out her website. And then, <laughs> then he, would, he would just sit there and wait by the phone. Yes. And they would, Excellent. Just, a couple of minutes later, he's like, they would call and they'd be like, um, pastor, <laughs> do you know? Yes, I know. Because you know? <laughs> my, my father actually tries to help me with love scenes. He tries to give me oh, advice for it. Oh, that's too far. And, that oh, is yes, crosses does. the line. No. Yes, he does. <laughs> no. And I'm like, I thought we agreed that I sprang from a seashell in the sea and my kids are immaculate conception. I, we don't talk about that. No. So, yes. But he actually gives me, he tries to give me advice on it and He's never read one of my books, and I'm glad about it. My mother has never read one. I told her she cannot read it. And because I just don't, you know, I don't want her to know that I know about it, even though I have kids. <laughs> so, but they're extremely supportive. <laughs> they're extremely supportive. Of it. All right. There's a question way Where in the back. There is a question. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. There's no. only one rule. <laughs> one rule. There's, There's only one rule. The question was, can a romance novel end unhappily? No. Um, and the answer is no. If, that's the one, you it, have, then suddenly you're in literary fiction. Well, or commercial love story. Yeah, like Nicholas Sparks is not romance. No, no. sorry, love story. Um, Romeo and Juliet. No, I don't know why we show but, this on on Valentine's Day. <laughs> love story. I saw a list on Valentine's Day um, at the Guardian of the best Rome, of the best love stories oh, to read, that. and the top one was Anna Karenina. And no. I'm going to spoil Anna Karenina for all of you, no. but she throws herself in front of a train. A train, y'all. <laughs> So it's no, not. It's so not. <laughs> but what I will say is that I would ask the question because I think that the the sort of subtext of of that 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 question and and sort of the argument around like is happily ever after does it make it a formula does it make it derivative in some way and I think um, most genre fiction is designed with an, a clear end game. Like a mystery wouldn't be mm -hmm. rewarding to you as a reader if you didn't see the end. A thriller wouldn't right. be rewarding to a reader if you didn't see the end and if you didn't figure out who'd done it. Um, and so Happily Ever After is really one of the log lines of genre fiction in general. Um, and one of the challenges I think that we all, that not just romance writers, mm -hmm. but writers of thrillers, mysteries, sci-fi, comic books, um, YA, when we all kind of talk about the genre, often what people are misunderstanding about genre writing, writing in genre, is that it's really ballet in a phone booth. I mean, we have such clear 
um, boundaries on our genre. There, there is, we have to end in Happily Ever After. Mm -hmm. And the journey, the introduction was so, so well done it because that it, it really is about the journey. journey to, in our case, Happily Ever After, in the case of Mysteries, the Who Done It, in the case of Thrillers, you know, the Who Done It. It's like the Happily Ever After the is the, is of the, the payoff. You yes. know, your, your characters are going through so many things. You know, first of all, when they start off, um, they might have a ton of baggage because maybe a dysfunctional childhood, family relations, um, trauma, and you don't want them to stay that way. You want to see them happy. You want to see them win. And then when two people are just going through so much, to, you, you want to, like the, the payoff in the end is that you know they're finally going to, find their way together. And, if, and me, if I get to the end of the book and they're not together, even a happily ever after for now makes me mad. Like, I need to know <laughs> they are going to be together or I get stabbed. Did you wipe me down on my one book because they didn't get married? I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, I'm no, surprised no. I'm talking to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. No, and, and I like to say, you say ballet in a phone booth. I like to think of it as, it's like a sonnet. Because, you know, when you write a sonnet, it's got a very different, uh, you've got syllables you're juggling, you've got a rhyme scheme, you're going to end with that couplet. I really think genre fiction, specifically romance, is very much like that. And the best romance writers are the ones who put their characters in a situation where you hit that three quarters of the way through the book, and you're like, well, I don't even know how they're, gonna how they're going to get these two people mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. and yet they do it anyway. And that is like the true beauty of the genre. And I mean, when, when mystery writers do that, they're celebrated. Right. Uh, yeah. And yet sometimes when romance writers do that, we get asked questions about Fabio. <laughs> um, <laughs> As you can tell, we're all very tired of Fabio. <laughs> that's, that's, that's okay. All right, questions? I can't see, can you see? I can, oh, hey. down here. Hello, lots of them. Yeah. In red. I have a question for Sally. Yes. Oh. Um, who are some of the writers that influenced you? And were they <coughs> writers in your earlier years? Okay, um, I read, everything, including but not limited to the backs of cereal boxes. <laughs> um, so, and, and my influences are pretty wide ranging. Um, I know one of them, I like, I love Jocelyn Jackson, that's one. Um, I, I, one of the few books that I have reread multiple times is Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Oh, I love it. And I would never even pretend to tell you that I can do what she does, but I have a real appreciation for that juxtaposition of, of um, the poetic prose and, and the dialogue. But when it comes to romance, what we were talking about this. We were talking about all the romances that I haven't read because I actually did my homework in college. It's a real She's problem. A <laughs> um, you know, the Fairy Queen hasn't done anything for me. I don't know why I read that. But um, when I left college, I was so tired of reading literature. And I picked up Nora Roberts' Midnight Bayou, mm. and I fell in yeah. love. It was just... I was like, this, this, is one of the, this is what I want to write. I want to write something that has this kind of sweeping adventure, something that can have history in it, something that's going to end up um, okay in the end, something with a dashing Cajun hero. I haven't written a da dashing Cajun hero yet, but give me time. Um, <laughs> but I, I think hopefully I've meandered and still managed to answer your question. I've had a lot of different influences. Some would say I have a little bit of Flannery O'Connor, a little bit of the macabre, but that's probably just because of the funeral director. This lady in red. Yes, um, my question is for Miss Simone. Um, I think your father's right about the blue collar worker, but I think the age needs to be older. I'm serious because successful women can marry who they want to. Absolutely, and I've seen many women that were, you know, reached executive status had blue collar husbands. And Absolutely, oh, and yes. My friends who are widows. It's very attractive to find a secure man who's good with their hands. I mean, it's... <laughs> I, see, yes. I see what you did. Put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> For first, anyone first who might all, have missed let that. Let me say, I see what you did there. And <laughs> with your hands. 
you're, you're absolutely right. I think one of, you know, he was joking with me, but I, I think one of the, the great things about romance is that choice. Mm -hmm. Women have the power of choice in romance. They can choose to be who they want to be. They can choose to be, um, they can choose to be married. They can choose not to be married. They can choose to have children. They can choose not to have children. They can choose to be with a blue collar man and be the, the breadwinner, or they can choose to work at home. They, they have so much, they can choose to be with somebody if they want to. You know, like one of my favorite things is a heroine who is so strong in herself, who owns herself, owns her, her power, her strength, her sexuality, and then who can walk this world and go forth in this life, walk this journey called life without love or without a man, but she chooses to be with the man. She doesn't, she doesn't need him, she just wants him. That's choice. And so I, I totally agree with you. Um, I'm not going to tell my father that you were right, though, but I'm, I totally agree with you. <laughs> See, we had that stays here. It stays here. <laughs> Don't we have a couple it. of questions over here. So I just always like to ask, if you could pair your most recent release with a beverage, what would it be? With a beverage? With a beverage. With a beverage. Oh. Oh, and most we could recent pair. Okay. release, most recent release with, with a, a beverage. beverage. I'm so boring. Um, I, I mean, oh, oh, I've got mine. <laughs> Go. All right. So my most recent release is called Oh My Stars, and it's um, about a couple who finds a baby in the manger of a drive-through nativity. Oh um, my gosh. That's, that's where the llama comes in, because the best part of this is, <laughs> let me tell you how I sold this book. I had written, I don't, I don't know how many writers there are in the audience, but you know when you have an option book, then you, you make something really special and you make it pretty and you polish it and you've got your synopsis and you've got your first three chapters. And I sent it off to my editor and he's like, that's great. Um, I want to make this a two book deal. I'm like, awesome. I like two book deals. And he says, would you write me a Christmas book? And I said, yes, I like Christmas. And he <laughs> said, what's it about? And I was like, we just discussed writing the Christmas book. <laughs> I didn't know we were on this discussion. And a smarter person would have said, let me get back to you. But I was not smart. So I said, well, there's a drive through nativity and they find a baby that's been abandoned in the manger and there are llamas. And he said, sold. <laughs> <laughs> that is. <laughs> but anyway, it just so happens that in that in that book, the um, and it starts with um, and a decree went out from my mother that I would be playing the Virgin Mary in the uh, drive-through nativity, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> so obviously, Mary and Joseph were somewhat under duress, and um, they are drinking a nice Merlot. Behind the Dollar General. <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot to mention the part where the drive through nativity is in the, in the Dollar General. But anyway, it's a nice Merlot. And I'm done. Next. <laughs> I don't follow that. I know. That was great. Yeah. Can I do that one too? <laughs> um, I, I think, I mean, at the risk of being very boring, I write historicals set in the 19th century. Um, my current heroes are all um, running, they're smugglers. Um, so it's rum. So <laughs> it's not rum. <laughs> uh, it's not rum, it's actually American bourbon. <gasps> so, um, the, so there it is, neat. Actually, no, not neat, on ice, because they smuggle it inside <laughs> ships, uh, inside ice-packed ships. Um, that's how they get, get it into London. Uh, my most recent release is the third book in... Uh, Harlequin series called The Blackout Billionaires. And the premise is each book starts during a blackout. Each couple meets during a, a blackout in a citywide blackout in Chicago. And you know, things happen in the dark, you know. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and then it carries on for, from there because you know, it always gets complicated, you know. So I think my drink would be 
a blackberry martini. I don't even know if that's a real thing, but I had to fit black into it. And martini just makes me think of somebody in a tuxedo, and he's a billionaire, so yeah, he's got to wear a tuxedo. So I'm going to go with that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, if a black, blackberry martini isn't a thing, it probably should be. It needs be. to be. It does. Hey, now you've made it a thing. Thank you. I did. Someone yes. here is a bartender. <laughs> yes. All right. Was there, wait, there was another question over here, wasn't there? No. No, she that was, was the same helper, question. A helper hand. Other questions? Oh, in the back. Uh, yes. There are two in the back. Closest to the corner. All right, okay. What is your favorite trip to read and your favorite trip to write? Favorite trip to read, favorite trip. Well, my favorite trip to read, um, I am a sucker and a half for a marriage of convenience. Yes. Um, and there aren't many of those in contemporary. Maybe you should explain what that is. Okay. You, oh, yeah, I should, shouldn't I? Uh, typically, that's in a historical romance where the hero and the heroine have to get married for some reason. They were caught in flagrante delecto. Um, <laughs> ruination is real. Ruination is real. We should put that on a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> or he needs money, or she needs money, or I don't know, just some somebody's aunt comes along, spinster aunt, and says, if you want the house, the two of you got to get married. I don't care. What I want to see is two people forced to get married and then fall in love at that point. Yes. Um, when it comes to one to write, what do I write? Um, that's, I'm, I'm gonna come back to me on that one. I've got to figure out what I write. You'd think I would know by now. <laughs> this is a hard question for me because I love a trope. Mm -hmm. um, so my, but my favorite, so... Romance is all built on tropes. I mean, and you, mm -hmm. you've all read many, many, many romance tropes. Even if um, you don't know even it. Even if you don't know that you have. Uh, my favorite trope is there's only one bed. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if there's only one bed and we're snowed in. Yes. <laughs> That's really a solid, there's only one bed. I also like we're on a road trip and there's only one room at the hotel and it, That's a good it only one. has one bed. I like Oops. all these versions of there's only one bed. Um, but I have never written there's only one How bed. I don't know I've never read, written it. Um, I, my favorite thing to write is childhood friends to enemies to lovers. So like mm. we, we were we loved each other as children, or we were best friends as children, and now we hate each other, but oops, we love each other. Oops. <laughs> There's so many oopses. <laughs> oops, the lights my, um, went out. <laughs> my favorite trope to read is like a fake engagement or a fake relationship mm -hmm. where they have to, they like make some kind of agreement, and okay, this is, we're gonna pretend to be um, girlfriend or boyfriend or pretend to be fiancés because we're both going to get something out of it and then in six months we're just going to break up. But of course it doesn't work out that way because along the way during a fake engagement where you have to pretend to be in love with each other, you do end up falling in love oops. with each other. Yeah, another oops. oops. So <laughs> that, that and friends to, friends to Lovers is one of my favorite to read because I love reading when somebody's eyes, like they've been friends forever and then somebody's eyes are open and they're suddenly looking at each other different mm -hmm. ways. And they're, they're seeing like each other as like sexual beings instead of just, you know, the person I took a bath with, you know? And, and Oops, now- There's only you know, one bathtub. You know. Can I just- <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> Can I just say though, <laughs> Naima, Naima Simone wrote what I believe is the best friends to lovers romance ever written. Um, and no, I'm not, I'm not just saying it because she's sitting next to me. She actually knows that I talk about this book anytime I can get a chance to. It's called Scoring Off the Field, and I'm going to tell everybody what it's about. Okay. Um, and you should all just buy it because it's excellent. Um, it's part of her WAG series. The hero is the like, star quarterback of a local NFL team. The heroine has been in unrequited love with him since they were like teenagers, and she is, her, she is his personal assistant. Oh. Um, and it begins with her realizing that he is never going to love her, and it is, this is a toxic experience for her, and she has to go live her life, which is like all, that is the money for me in romance. Like, mm -hmm. get out of this, the, crush these men and go live your life, ladies. <laughs> yes. and, and then she does, she quits in that first chapter, mm -hmm. and Where's he just like unravels, because he can't deal with losing her from his life. 
and it is long, it is this like beautiful, long, slow burn of a love story that he refuses to like give in to his feelings for her because football players and machismo know, and thank you, I'm sorry, I've got to go buy that. And then, and, and it's no. just <laughs> perfection. Um, and I figured out what I write. I do, I do a lot of second I'm chance. I'm done. Like, I can, it's perfection. Yeah, it's yeah. a perfect book. I do what a lot said? of second chance. What she said? Oh. oh, I said I do a lot of second chance. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, people who have, they were together, something happened, oh. they get back together. <laughs> Family feuds. No, but I just, this book. I just love when you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm such a good writer. Because you are. <laughs> I'm freaking brilliant, people. <laughs> Because Friends to Lovers is actually my least favorite genre to read because often it lacks all conflict, right? Like there's, mm -hmm. you're two lovely people who already like each other. Right. What is the problem? Why am I reading 400 pages of you? I mean, um, seriously, like go I need have a there good... to be a conflict. There, yeah, exactly. Because a lot of times it's like, could y'all just go get coffee and maybe hash this out? Yeah, <laughs> just have a conversation, you yeah. idiots. Um, I mean, you got to have more conflict than so that. so good. Anyway. Yes. But now you're done. Yeah, We're I'm done. done. Yes. I don't it's want to okay. follow that. There's nothing else I can do. Bask in the glory. We did have one more question up here, I think. That was our oh, last oh, question. Okay. You don't want us to keep going? I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.